Masters was from Illinois, but his uh, Spoon River Anthology, which is the one and only book that he's really remembered for. Uh, he, uh, he was a lawyer, but he also wrote poetry throughout his long life, but essentially, and he knew it too, he just kept working on this same book and updating it. Essentially, he was known uh, for this one classic book, uh, which we'll be talking about in this video. Masters was not from Chicago. He was not from Springfield, like Vachel Lindsay. He was from a small town in Illinois. Actually, he grew up in two different small towns. One of them was on the Spoon River. One of them was on a different one. Uh, the Spoon River is real, but uh, the town of Spoon River does not exist. It, it was an amalgam of the two towns that Masters had grown up in in rural, rural Illinois. Lincoln does turn up in it uh, in the poem about Hannah Armstrong that I asked you to read uh, in addition to the one about Anne Rutledge that I did not ask you to read. The Anne Rutledge one is interesting, but um, the story of her supposed youthful romance with Lincoln, how she died young, uh, and how uh, Lincoln always really loved her is kind of the, uh, the world of mythology. We're not sure if it was true, although Carl Sandburg put it prominently in his biography. So we're going to leave Anne Rutledge and uh, just focus on the, the fictional version of the true Lincoln uh, that is uh, pictured so uh, strongly in uh, Hannah Armstrong. Hannah's poem and the poems of the other three writers, uh, um, the other three characters, I should say, uh, in Master's writing are all the stories of dead people. If you looked at the introduction, you know that uh, Spoon River Anthology is uh, what I consider to be a great idea. It's a collection of poems supposedly spoken by the people in the cemetery of Spoon River. Uh, if that seems a little bit macabre, I think it's much less so than the, the way American culture uh, celebrates uh, death, zombies, etc., on Halloween. It's simply that Masters imagines Perhaps he was really in a small town cemetery and had this idea, or perhaps he just felt this would be a good way to tell about the life of the town and the way the people impacted each other's lives. What he did was to imagine that if you're looking at the, the cemetery and all the names on the headstones, that they could talk about their lives uh, and tell you uh, what they did, how they felt about it, who they loved, what was important in their lives, and sometimes, because some of these are wicked people, uh, who they hated and what things they did wrong in their lives. Master starts off his book of poetry with a, um, an introductory poem, which is also in our book. I did not assign it. I'll just uh, take a look at it with you. It's called The Hill on page 446. And it's the only, I think, really poetic poem in this collection. Uh, you can see that they are free verse, I personally just don't see him as a poet. This is not Walt Whitman style free verse. There is absolutely nothing in it that doesn't just seem like speech. Now these characters are meant to be talking. They're meant to actually be speaking from the grave as I'll say more about later. But it just seems like talking and Masters could probably have done just as good a job putting little paragraphs uh, in prose by each character in the same words throughout his book. But the hill is somewhat poetic. If you look at the, uh, the left side of the page, you see a lot of ones, Whitman-style repetition. And then we have the, uh, the very rhythmic refrain, all, all are sleeping on the hill. All are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. What are they doing? Of course, these are people in a cemetery uh, people whose lives are finished and in master's imagination are just waiting to tell us all about their lives. That's what Spoon River Anthology is. Uh, the brief Meet the Author uh, points out where Masters is from. It points out that he didn't really write any notable poems outside of Spoon River Anthology uh, and that uh, each person in the cemetery, in the collection, tells his or her story in a little poem. That's the premise. I read in one introduction to this book that although it seems very original, he got the idea from the Greek anthology, which is a collection of little epigrams or uh, poems summing up the lives of uh, various uh, 
real or imaginary Greeks thousands of years ago. I already covered the Anne Rutledge poem. The other two on page 447, I assigned you both of them because I, I like the story and I like the way that it shows that Masters connects uh, two or very often more characters in Spoon River Anthology in a story. Emily Sparks and Ruben Pantier, as you can see if you've read them, obviously it's pretty clear as soon as you read the first line of the Ruben Pantier poem, are linked. Emily Sparks was a teacher and when we've read both poems, then we understand much more about what her poem was all about. If we read Emily Sparks first, she starts, where is my boy, my boy, the boy I loved best of all in the school? And of course, we don't know who he is. All we know is that she was an old maid. The children she teaches are like her children because she has no husband, no family of her own. Uh, it says here that she, as a good Christian teacher, would prays for her students. She prayed for this boy. Uh, she even wrote him about Christ's love, and, and she hopes that uh, he has remembered, not so much her as remembered the message. Uh, there's a, a fire image, which uh, T.S. Eliot also uses very well in a poem uh, to represent uh, spiritual light and the... Uh, the, the, the burning passion for God that should be in us. Uh, at the end, she says that, that she wants the, the clay of him, that is the, the flesh, the sinful earthly desires that are immortal, will yield to the immortal, spiritual part of us till the fire is nothing but light. And uh, her name, of course, Sparks, uh, is meant to be symbolic of this, that she wants to put a spark in him uh, and make that spiritual flame rise in him. And so when we read Ruben Pantier, we can see immediately, immediately that there's a connection. Well, Emily Sparks, your prayers were not wasted. And although she doesn't know it, although she says from her grave, where is this boy? And Masters poignantly, poignantly never lets her find out. Ruben Pantier always remembered her. He lived a sinful life. I love how he says in line nine, the milliner's daughter made me trouble. A milliner is a hat maker, it's not a miller, but he made trouble for her. They made trouble together, which led him to have to leave the town to escape the scandal. He lived for wine, women, and song, as they say, or in line 11, wine and women and joy of life. Uh, in Paris, uh, appropriately, kind of a sin city of Europe, where he's drinking wine with a no doubt uh, not virtuous woman, he starts crying, thinking of Emily Sparks. Uh, and uh, the woman he's with believes that he's crying for her. He says there that from then on he had a new vision. But what's interesting about the end of the poem is that Masters does not let us know what happened. Did he become a Christian? Did he live in a better way from then on? because of his teacher's prayers and her example, which clearly were very important to him? Or was he just emotional because of the wine and he continued on in the same kind of life? I don't know if Masters was a believer. I know he was very left-wing politically. Uh, there's not a whole lot in this collection that uh, supports the idea of Christian faith, so we can only assume uh, what point he finally meant to make with Ruben Pantier. On page 448 and 449, there are two more uh, epitaph poems that I asked you to read, Lois Spears and uh, the aforementioned Hannah Armstrong. There are two that I did not assign. Uh, Reverend Lemuel Wiley uh, is actually an example of one of, one of Master's interlocking stories. Uh, the Reverend Wiley mentions these people called the Blisses who did not divorce our book as they did with Emily Dickinson. Uh, select a little too much uh, in the uh, pro-faith and positive direction. I can understand why they did that with both Dickinson and Masters, but it's not completely true to life. A lot of Masters poems, uh, and I've read the whole book, uh, a lot of them were, um, were told by uh, non-believers. One of them rails against God, like uh, the, the modern furious atheist writers that you find in the on the book charts. Um, some very, as I said before, wicked people, not like Ruben Pontier. 
not sinners who were sorry, but sinners who weren't sorry. So also with Lemuel Wiley, if I remember right, uh, there are later poems by the blisses or about them showing that the fact that they didn't divorce was somehow bad, that their marriage was actually very unhappy and supposedly making the reverence poem um, ironic and untrue. However, the Lucinda Matlock story is very similar to the Lois Spears one. They were both uh, wives and mothers uh, who were very um, afflicted in some ways. Lois Spears, of course, was blind. Lucinda Matlock uh, lost some of her, her children, 12 children, eight of whom we lost. That's pretty terrible, even by 19th century standards. But in both cases, the women never lost their faith never became sad or complained uh, or uh, turned away from God or uh, became bitter people. In Lois Spears' case, he starts off interestingly by making it seem like a real epitaph, which he doesn't do in most of his poems. Perhaps she wants to picture herself in Master's eyes uh, as uh, the wife and mother and daughter of other people. Uh, she then writes, um, I think, thankfully to God, in uh, line five, children with clear eyes and sound limbs. She's talking about her children. These children were healthy, uh, not handicapped, and then Masters does a lovely little job here. Uh, he just puts it in parentheses, I was born blind. And then she moves on to tell how happy she was, and as a feminist of today would certainly say she should not be happy as a wife, mother, and housekeeper. Well, the fact that she refers only parenthetically to being blind, of course, is making a point. Uh, the fictional Lois Spears, like the real Fanny Crosby, did not want to be pitied and did not want to focus on her handicap, but on what she was able to do and on the gifts she did have in life. Uh, there is a, a rather odd simile, slightly grotesque simile, I think, but um, Masters was trying to sum up how she handled her blindness. She went about doing her housework, dealing with everything as though there were eyes in my fingertips. <laughs> well, of course, what's meant is that uh, blind people uh, get uh, such strength in their other senses and uh, such ability uh, to almost see uh, through their fingers through their ears, etc., that uh, Lois Spears was doing the same. She ends the poem beautifully, quoting the Bible, of course, what the angels sang at, at Jesus' birth. Uh, she sums up her life as well as Lucinda Matlock, sums up hers in her last words, glory to God in the highest. Hannah Armstrong, um, we don't know much about her. We don't know uh, whether she was uh, happy generally in her life like these other women. Uh, whether she had afflictions in her life. All we know is that her son was in the army in the Civil War. Uh, we assume it's the Civil War because of the references to uh, old Abe, who of course was Abe Lincoln in the White House. And um, it's just a, a fragment of her life, but apparently Masters wanted to present her as not like Lois Spears, Emily Sparks, Lucinda Matlock, telling about her entire life and summing it up in a short poem. But as he does with some of his other characters, uh, one incident in her life obviously was particularly important to her. What she really remembers from the grave is how she went to see the President of the United States for a personal matter that she felt her son was too sick to serve in the army and needed to be discharged. Uh, of course, today, probably no one would ever get through to him with all the security. There should have been better security, as it turns out, of course, as Lincoln was killed. But there was no Secret Service in those days. Uh, and so Hannah Armstrong first wrote a letter. She shows her naivete, her innocence, by saying maybe he couldn't read it. Or then the next uh, letter, maybe that was lost in the mails. Of course, um, Lincoln's staff and clerks and people like that just didn't let the letter get to the president. Uh, they felt he had more important things to do. So she traveled all the way to Washington from Illinois 
and she said uh, to the guards that, uh, you know, well, we called him Abe, and it's old Aunt Anna Armstrong from Illinois. Lincoln, uh, obviously being shown as the, the real man of the people, a figure always tied to where he came from, to the rest of us, not uh, raised above everyone else, uh, just as Carl Sandburg, of course, presented him. Lincoln drops everything, uh, drops all of his cares and worries connected with the Civil War, which we know gave him Great Depression and made his life very hard, uh, and was absolutely happy to see Anna Armstrong. Uh, they, they talked of uh, old days, they told stories, he laughed, and he personally wrote out her son's discharge from the war. So uh, for the second of three times, the third will come in your Vacha Lindsay reading, uh, we have an image of uh, America's most iconic president.